أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن علومك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما My brothers and my sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إمام الحسن عليه السلام خلافة lasted for about six to seven months In this time, he was betrayed by most of his army and eventually, even those that were close and loyal to him were to leave his side when his hand was forced into engaging in a treaty with Muawiyah. Imam al Hassan, for several months, was wearing an armor underneath his clothes because of the amount of the assassination attempts. Even one time when he was in prayer, an arrow was shot at him in his salat, and because of the armor, he was able to live through the injury. Imam al Hassan salam, was stabbed by one of his own soldiers. Imam al Hassan eventually had to engage in this treaty, and once he did, those who stood against the treaty also left his side. So he had to do what was best for the believers despite what they thought was best for them. The Ahlul Bayt, of course, stood by his side. Eventually, this all led to the rule of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan as the Khalifa of the Muslims. In the year 41 after Hijrah, Muawiyah became the Caliph. And for the next nine years of his life, Imam al Hassan salam, lived under the rule of Muawiyah. Muawiyah ruled for almost 20 years. The following 10 years, 9 to 10 years, were during the lifetime of Imam al Hassan. He lived under this rule of Muawiyah. Now we need to understand what this rule was like. Because we are told at times Muawiyah was a great leader, a man of the people, a man of the Muslims. Was he really so just? What was this rule like? The one benefit of Muawiyah becoming the Khalifa was that Imam al-Hasan could go back to Medina as a free man and could re-educate his people from grassroots efforts. But till now, the Muslims don't know the truth about Muawiyah and his policies. So I want to speak about a few of them. The first one being a policy that affects us to this day, and one that I've spoken about several times. The sheer amount of fabrications in the corpus of Hadith, that which had reached us, Muawiyah, had his scholars, his paid scholars for dollars, infiltrate their words into the hadith books. And what he wanted to do was to neutralize the esteemed stature of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He wanted to make him seem normal, or the Ahlul Bayt seem normal. He wanted to change the way he was seen because he couldn't change the past so he tried to impact the future. He did not want to remain seen as one of the tulaqa because that gave him this great inferiority complex that he suffered from. He wanted to be seen as that man of the Muslim ummah, that great leader and caliph. And to some extent, he succeeded when it came to some Muslims. But we want to prove otherwise. Muawiyah had a policy where whoever brought forth a hadith would be paid for their efforts, even if the hadith was not sourced. And he began by telling the people to come and relate every hadith they knew of the Sahabi Uthman, and him being the third Khalifa. So people came and started to narrate about Uthman ibn Affan, whether they knew him or not, whether it was a true hadith or not. And every hadith was recorded and people were given their reward. Then, the second stage was to narrate general hadith about all Sahabis. So all companions, everyone who claimed to be a companion, 
would come, people would come and narrate about these companions, narrate about how great these men were. So hundreds and thousands of hadith showed up without sources. There were professional, professional storytellers at the time known as Qassasun. These people used to narrate stories in the most effective of ways. It was like an event, people would crowd around them and they would narrate. So these storytellers started to come and narrate hadiths. Hadiths that people would follow, that people would base their religion on, were now being reported by random storytellers and random people in exchange for money. Muawiyah even sought out a scholar by the name of Samarat ibn Junub. And this man, he had authored a book known as al ithqul Yatim. Muawiyah asked this scholar to narrate certain ayat in the Qur'an about individuals who the Qur'an spoke of in derogatory terms. And he wanted him to say that these individuals were actually Imam Ali alayhi salam. So Muawiyah told him, I will pay you 100,000 dinar to do this. And the man refused. He told him, I'll pay you 200,000 dinar to do this. Again, the scholar refused. 300,000, he refused. 400,000 dinar, finally he accepted. And so he went to the Qur'an and he went to the ayah 204 from Surah Al-Baqarah. And he read that the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he spoke of in that ayah about an individual where Allah says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ that Allah has said. There are those people who, they impress you in their speech. In this worldly life, they talk and they say that Allah bears witness upon the sincerity in their hearts. But in truth, Allah knows what's in their hearts. And in their hearts, they are the most fiercest of enemies. This man tried to claim that this was about Ali ibn Abi Talib. That Imam Ali, was one who claimed good words, but in his heart was evil. Muawiyah would pay them to narrate that these ayat, to do tafsir, that these ayat were about the Imam. He wanted to neutralize the Imam. He wanted to make him seem normal. And because he couldn't do that, he tried to make everyone else seem great. So the fabrications, the sheer hundreds and thousands of fabrications, they even reached us today. And that's why we see People who weren't even around the time of the Prophet are generally speaking about what happened in the lifetime of the Prophet as if they were there, as if they saw it. Another policy that Muawiyah would push forward was that of investing into his security forces. There were no security forces before like Muawiyah's. Not in the time of the first, the second or the third Khalifa. He had special police for special laws. So, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, if some people made some mistakes, of course, they would be punished if they had to be. But their homes wouldn't be destroyed. They wouldn't have their lives and livelihoods destroyed. They wouldn't be taken and tortured. They wouldn't be killed in some cases. Muawiyah had struck fear into the heart of people. And the security forces would often spy and look, especially for those they would call Turabi. Turabi meant that you were a lover of Abu Turab, a lover of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So the lovers of Imam Ali alayhi salam, they had a special punishment. These spies would literally write down every small action that townspeople would do. Any small mistake, was a grave mistake. He would kill on presumption. You were guilty until you were proven innocent. So anyone who truly loved Imam Ali, their life was in utter danger. Their lives and the lives of their children. We had special forces just for this. And this was the first terrorist government under the geese of Islam. The first time. When we see in today, in the modern era, people who claim to run their countries and nations by Islam, but run it in a terrorist fashion, they're following, they're following this methodology. Another policy that Muawiyah invested in was that of the Umayyad army. 
which became a famous army, but for the wrong reasons. It was a merciless army. It was not like usual armies. Usual armies want to go and want to achieve their aims and goals, like the hunting dog. But this army was not like the hunting dog. This army was like the wolf. It would continue to play with your meat after having eaten. This army, when it would attack, it would not attack only to defeat another army. It wanted to humiliate and destroy. They would go into villages and they would burn houses to the ground. They would burn trees to the ground. They would burn food. They would kill on sight. They would pillage. They would rape. They would do whatever they had to do to cause chaos and destruction and strike fear into the hearts of people so that no one would dare stand in their way. Muawiyah had built a momentum that he could not stop. He had to keep the pressure on the people because there was a fear of revolt. Always, if he was ever to take his foot off the gas. So it continued and continued in this way. That no one would dare stand against the Umayyad army. Muawiyah's policy of wealth even differed than those before him. His predecessors, even though they had their own ways of distributing wealth, even though Uthman ibn Affan and Umar ibn Khattab had their own ways of distributing wealth, they never considered the treasury to be their personal wealth. Whereas Muawiyah considered the money in Baytul Muslimin to be his money. And he would retract it from who he wished. It was his. The way in which he would distribute was based on it being his money. This had never happened before in the Ummah. He had starved the people of Iraq and the people of Medina. Any of those places which showed loyalty to Imam Ali, all those people who had once shown loyalty to Imam Ali, now were to pay the price. It got to a point in Medina that people had to sell their homes to get by because they did not receive a dime. Until at one point there was not a camel in sight in all of Medina, not one camel remained. And the way that he would distribute the wealth was very unfair. At times, when people would come to take their money. There is one report where he gave a man 500 dirhams and the man said, is this all you will give me? And Muawiyah replied, if you want more, you have to be like those people that I bought their religion from. And so he says, fine, buy my religion from me. If it means I make more money. So he said, then I buy your religion from you. He would literally mock, mock the religion. Another man, when he received his money, as he was leaving, Muawiyah said, wait, wait, were you in the battle of Jamal? Were you fighting against Imam Ali? And the man said, yes. He said, give him more money. So based on what you did before, you were now going to be rewarded or punished. Then he called for the man known as Ziyad. Now we know him as Ziyad ibn Abi, the son of his father, because his father wasn't known. He called for Ziyad. And he said, Ziyad, I want you to work for me. Ziyad at first refused, but Muawiyah sent him a letter saying, from Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan ila Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. He said that you are my brother. We have the same father. So even though his father wasn't known, he allowed him to claim that his father was Abi Sufyan. Now, it was known that Ziyad's mother was an adulteress. And it's known that if you are the son of an adulteress and adulterer, then you cannot lead the jama'ah prayer, you're known as Ibn Zina. Yet he brought Ziyad Ibn Abi, and he made him the governor of Kufa, and he made him pray the jama'ah prayer in front of all the Shia, in order to humiliate them, even though the salat was batila, and everyone knew it was, they couldn't do anything about it. So Ziyad would do whatever he wanted, Muawiyah wanted to humiliate all those who ever showed loyalty to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he would continue to hunt them down, or blind them, or cut off their hands, or exile them, or disperse them. The Shia of Ali were never allowed to be united, always dispersed. And Muawiyah made sure that he made the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib a tradition. One that you had to follow, that you could not stand against. If you stood against it, then you would also be punished. You had to engage in it. And it became a culture of loyalty. So what would happen is, 
because it was a tradition now and it was highly rewarded, and those who didn't do it, or those who were known as Turabi, were going to re- be reported to the spies and the government, businesses that would compete in the marketplace, they would go and report each other that he is a lover of Ali Nabi Talib, or he is one that doesn't curse Ali Nabi Talib. Why? So that the government forces can come and destroy and burn down the competing business. So imagine, everyone tried to show their loyalty more, loud and proud, by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is how you showed that you were on side with the government. And if you didn't do that, then you were to lose your livelihood. You were to lose your business. So people would compete each other in cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the level that it got to. You had to be close to the people in power. And if you refused, it was no one would happen. Like the great companion, Hujr ibn Uday, the companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam, he refused. And he stood against the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he was a man of great stature. He was a famous tribesman. He was of great stature amongst his clan. And he had a large clan. He had a large group of friends. Him. He and his group were taken. And they were to be killed. Because they refused to stand. They refused to remain silent in the face of this tyranny. And they refused to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib and they spoke against it. You were not allowed to speak against it. And Hujr even had to watch his son die in front of him. He requested, his final request was, if you're going to kill us, kill my son in front of me. So I make sure that he does not become weak at the point of death and turn his back on his master, Ali ibn Abi Talib. I want to make sure I want to oversee his death and make sure he dies upon a firm and pure creed, a pure aqidah, as a lover of Ali ibn Talib. Then you can kill me. So he watched his son die in front of him and ensured that his son remained strong in his final moments. And then they killed his son and they killed Hujr. Again and again and again. The Shia of Imam Ali were hunted down and oppressed. These were very difficult 10 years under the rule of Muawiyah whilst Imam al-Hassan was still alive. But even though these difficulties resumed, Imam al-Hassan was able to use his freedom to his advantage to re-educate the people. And he was succeeding and the people began to gravitate towards him more. Some people would even regret their stances 10 years ago. And Muawiyah saw what was occurring. And those around Muawiyah saw what was occurring. And Amr ibn al-As came to Muawiyah and told him, We have to stop him in his tracks. We can't continue to let him go around and speak to people the way he's doing. If he continues, there may be a revolution. So Muawiyah told him, What do you suggest we do? So Amr said, Call him to us. Let's have a gathering and call him and humiliate him. Let's bring him down. Muawiyah told them they wouldn't succeed if they tried to go head to head against Imam al-Hassan publicly in speech. But Amr, but Amr ibn al-As wanted to try anyway. So they had gathered Muawiyah with Yazid ibn Muawiyah, with Walid ibn Uqba, with Amr ibn al-As with many of those enemies of the Ahlul Bayt gathering and cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib, a gathering of curses. And they sent for Imam al-Hassan to come towards them. Imam al-Hassan was told about this gathering and told that they were waiting for him. And he knew these people who hate him and hate his father had something in store. They were planning something. So the first thing the Imam did was look to the heavens and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for aid. In a time when enemies surround you and Allah is with you, there is nothing to fear. And so Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam with a heart of courage goes towards this group of men. And as soon as he enters into their presence, Amr ibn al-As looks at him and says, your father is the one who is to blame for the deaths of the three previous Khalifas. Imagine, it's been 10 years since Muawiyah has been a Khalifa. 
and now they're trying out of nowhere just to bring something to start to hassle Imam al Hassan. Your father is the one who's to blame for the deaths of the first three Khalifas, and you are a fool just like he was. They called him and his father fools. And I find it hard to even say the word that he said in the Arabic language. So he called him a fool, called his father a fool, and then he began to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib in the presence of Hassan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam. Imam al-Hassan looked at Amr ibn al-As and said, Ya Amr, before you come to talk about my father, shouldn't we know who your father even is? Why are you speaking about people's fathers when you are known as Ibn al-As only because you chose al-As ibn Wa'il to be your father? It could have been anyone between him and Abu Sufyan and Walid and all these other men that could have been with your mother. She was known. Her occupation was known. Before you come and speak about my father or someone else's father, where do you come from? Well, it's your lineage. Pipe down. He struck Amr ibn al-Ha straight back. Walid ibn Uqba also tried to speak. Several of them came and tried to speak. Another one of the group came and intervened. Yaman Hassan looked at him and said, Who are you? Are you even relevant? What do you have to do in this conversation? You remind me of a mosquito that is on a tree. When it flies off, it wants to announce that it's flying away. And the tree didn't even know it was there in the first place. What's your place here? Irrelevant. Another one came, Walid ibn Aqba, and he tried to speak and curse Imam Ali alayhi salam. And the Imam Hassan looked at him and said, no wonder you're here. It's obvious after your father was struck down by my father in Badr, and after my father lashed you for praying Fajr with four rak'ahs and praying drunk. After everything my father and your father have been through, and you've been through with my father, I'm not surprised that you're here amongst these people, hating on Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. In any case, you're older than the one you claim to be your father. You too. It's not clear where you come from. Your lineage is not clear. All of you here coming to speak about my father. Where do you come from? Everyone was dumbfounded. They sat down speechless. Imam al Hassan's sharpness of tongue struck them down and he applied the hadith. If you cannot change oppression with your hand, then change it with your tongue. If, you're not, if you cannot change it with your tongue, then with your heart. Imam al Hassan's tongue was a sword on that day. And they didn't approach him again, but they had to do something. And as Muawiyah's time was coming to an end, Muawiyah saw his death was approaching. And he wanted to ensure that Yazid would be the Khalifa after him. So one by one, he would identify all of those that could contest and compete with Yazid as the leader. And so he looked around and saw that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was one of these people that could compete with Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Sa'ad was one of the six in the Shura of Umar. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is the father of Umar ibn Sa'ad, the one who would lead the army on the day of Karbala. That's how close to home it was. Umar ibn Sa'ad, his father Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was one of the six in the shura of Umar, along with Imam Ali alayhi salam and Umar ibn Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan. Now we have Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas that was killed. We have Abdul Rahman ibn Khalid ibn Walid, because his father Khalid was a famous great warrior. So Abdul Rahman could contest with Yazid and he had him dealt with too. And he had several attempts to get rid of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. However, the first one or two times Imam al Hassan had taken poison, he had survived. Muawiyah wanted to torture Imam al Hassan mentally and also he wanted people to stop loving him. It wasn't enough just to kill him. He wanted people not to be loyal to him. Because over those 10 years, 
Imam al Hassan was able to garner loyalty once again, especially with his name as the son of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi. He wanted to get rid of this, so he ensured that the governor of Kufa would often and Medina would often curse Imam Ali alayhi salam in the Friday prayer, and Imam al Hassan would have to attend this prayer. So he had to attend, watching people curse his father. Aside from surviving those assassination attempts, it seemed that the way Muawiyah would succeed was to infiltrate into the close circle of the family of Imam al Hassan. And he organized with one of the wives of the Imam to betray him, Jada bint al Ash'ath, to organize poison into the iftar of Imam al Hassan on a day that he was fasting, that when he would come to break his fast, she would put the poison into his food and leave. Once Juhda had left, Imam al Hassan had sat down to take this food into his mouth, to drink and quench his thirst, his parched lips. And as soon as he began to eat and swallowed his food, the poison had entered his body and began to attack him from the inside. A poison that would destroy whoever was to take it in was put into the food of Imam al Hassan. As soon as Imam al Hassan felt that sharp pain in his body, he dropped to the ground. Imam al Hussein saw him and ran to his brother. He said, Brother, tell me, what's wrong? And the Imam would have blood coming out of his mouth. And so he told him, Brother, I've taken poison into my body once again, but it's different this time. I've never felt anything like this. And he would squirm, moving side to side. Imam al Hussein was holding him and told him, Tell me, who was it? Who did it? And Imam al Hassan told him, Brother, don't think about that now. Leave them to Allah. Bring me a bowl. Let me cough my blood into the bowl. So Imam al Hussein brought the bowl. And as Imam al Hassan was coughing into the bowl, bits of his liver would come out. Sayyidah Zainab السلام, entered the room. Imam al Hassan hid the bowl immediately. He had the Imam al Hussein block it. He did not want Sayyidah Zainab to see him in that state as she and Imam al Hussein tended to Imam al Hassan. For days on end, he fell sick, suffering from deep pain, moving side to side. He told Imam al Hussein his final will, he told him, Brother, I feel myself slowly coming to the end. Once my soul leaves my body, I want you to close my eyes and wash my body, and you wrap me in my shroud. And brother, I want you to take my body to the tomb of our grandfather, so that I may pay my allegiance to him for the last time. And then I want you to take me to be buried next to my grandmother in Baqiyah, next to Fatima bint Asad. And brother, I know what will happen. People will think you want to bury me next to our grandfather and they won't let you. So, as my request to you, do not let even a drop of blood be shed in my name amongst the Muslims. I don't want you to fight. That's my request. And Imam al Hussein told him, I accept whatever you request of me, my brother. As he held him, Imam al Hussein began to weep. Imam al Hassan told him, Brother, why are you crying? Imam al Hussein replied, Because of what I see, because of your state, because of the pain that you're in. When you're in pain, I'm in pain. Imam al Hassan told him, Brother, it's true I took poison. It's true that I'm in pain. And it's true that I'm going to leave this world shortly. But there is no day like your day, Ya Aba Abdullah. لا يوم كيومك يا أبا عبد الله. On that day, where you will be surrounded by thirty thousand, I won't be near you. I won't be next to you. I wish I could be. When they take your women and children captive, I wish I could be there to defend you, but I won't be there. You cry for me now, but on that day. The skies will weep for you, and the beasts of the wild will weep for you. 
and the whales of the sea will weep for you. And in that moment, imagine Imam al Hassan is weeping for his brother Hussein, and Imam al Hussein is weeping for his brother Hassan. Then Imam al Hassan said, Brother, bring my children to me. So Imam al Hussein called the family of Imam al Hassan and they all sat down. He told them, My family, just as I was your leader, Hussein is now your leader. He is now your Imam. Obey him as you have obeyed me. Hussein called my siblings. So Imam al-Hussein went and brought the extended family. And Imam al-Hassan began to pray for them. Hafadhakum Allah. May Allah protect you all. I say my goodbyes to you now. Allah is sufficient for me to take care of you. Allah is my vicegerent upon you. Allah will bless you and he will protect you while I am gone. He began to say his goodbyes to everyone and ensure that they all pledge allegiance to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. And as Imam al-Hussein held him tightly and held his shirt tightly in his arms, hand in hand, he had tightly gripped his palms. He felt it loosen bit by bit until it was completely loose. He felt just a small squeeze at the end and he heard the whispers of Imam al Hassan as his lips barely moved as he said, Wa alaykum as salam, ya malaikat rabbi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He was sending his salams upon the angels as his soul left this world. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. The Ahlul Bayt were in tears. People in Medina were crying. It was a great tragedy. Just like when Imam Ali had left this world and people would crowd around the house and cry. Now people were doing the same. <sighs> Imam Al-Hussein took his brother and closed his eyes as he asked him to and washed his body and wrapped him in the shroud. And then he carried him and took him towards the grave of their grandfather. And as they approached... There was a gathering of the Bani Umayyah with Marwan ibn al-Hakam with Aisha bint Abu Bakr. <sighs> Aisha was on a mule and she went and stood in front of the place where the Prophet is buried. And she said, I will accept no one come near here to be buried here. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, the brother of Imam al-Hassan, said one day on a camel, one day on a mule. She looked at him and said, what's it to you what happens with the sons of Fatima? Ibn Abbas then looked at her and said, you do know and you guys do realize, you and Marwan and everyone else here, you realize that if Hassan had wanted to be buried there, nothing would stop us from burying him there. The Banu Umayyah were getting ready to unsheathe their swords. As were the Banu Hashim. There was going to be a battle amongst the clans. Imam al Hussein stopped everyone because of the request of Imam al Hassan. And then he looked at the Banu Umayyah and told them, I swear to God, if my brother had not told me that he didn't want a drop of blood to be shed in his name, then the swords of God would have taken what they would have taken from you. You would have seen. But because of my brother, and because of my promise to him, I will not fight on this day. Marwan ibn al-Hakam then ordered for arrows to be shot onto the coffin of Imam al-Hasan. And at that point, Abu Fadl al-Abbas stood up. And how dare you shoot arrows at the coffin of my brother? But Imam al-Hussein stopped him at that point. No one could stop Abu Fadl except Abu Abdullah. And as Abu Fadl always was obedient to his master, he was obedient there and stopped himself. Imam al-Hussein stopped Abu Fadl al-Abbas and told them, this is for Hassan. Our Imam 
told us not to fight. They took the body of Imam al Hassan. Very painful moment to know that when the Prophet was dying, there was an election. Imam Ali was buried in secret. Fatima al Zahra السلام, is buried in secret. Imam al Hassan has arrows shot at his body. And we didn't even get to what was to occur to the body of Imam al Hussein. This very painful moment as the Imam takes the body back, Imam al Hussein takes the body to Baqia and buries his brother with their grandmother. Is this the moment a brother buries his brother? Ya Hassan. In every path, in every moment in this life, we were together. With my grandfather, we were together. When we buried our mother, we were together. When we buried our father, we were together. When we carried him from the Masjid of Kufa, while he was bloodied, we were together. When we broke the news to Zainab, we were together. But now I bury you alone. He buries Imam al Hassan. He buries his brother. And now the weight, the burden, and the responsibility of being God's authority on earth is on the shoulders of Hussein ibn Ali. For the next 10 years, Imam al Hussein would have to endure this oppressive rule of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And then, he would rise up against his tyrannical son, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin.